Okay, we have Missouri coach Dennis Gates. Uh, coach, I'll lead it off. Um, you've had a chance now to observe Princeton and what they do and looking at tape and getting a good practice in. Uh, um, what's going to be the key for your team tomorrow? Well, that's a great question. I've always had a um, respect level for Princeton. I remember in high school, Pete Corral came to my high school to recruit a, a fellow teammate. And I've always followed their program and their success, their tradition. Um, Pete Corral, Bill Carmody, John Thompson III, uh, but also Mitch Henderson. Mitch has done a great job. He was an assistant at Northwestern for a period of time. Me being a Chicago guy, I truly believe he has definitely taken the program in the right direction uh, and done a tremendous job and is, is definitely a great sight to see. Um, the success that he's had because we've had several conversations, whether it's in the same gym or different gyms recruiting. Um, but they do a great job. Whenever you have a player of the year, a rookie of the year, freshman of the year, and multiple guys getting postseason accolades, uh, it's a tremendous honor. Questions from the audience? Be sure you have the microphone in hand. Thank you. NBC Sports Radio, Tony Harvey. Uh, uh, Dennis, I don't know if you had a chance to look at that game or look at some of the games that Princeton's play, but uh, your players even said that they're here for a reason. They got here. They earned their way to get here. Uh, what do you think about, you know, these type of teams? You know, they always considered the, uh, the underdog, but as we seen yesterday, they could surprise the hell out of you. But what is your thoughts on that? My thoughts is, is simple. You're not in this tournament if you're not a great team. And they have done a great job in the Ivy League, but also throughout their time as um, a program in tradition. Again, Mitch has been to postseason play. He's been to NITs. He's been to NCAA tournament. This isn't his first rodeo. He, he has had his guys prepared and will have them prepared. Uh, we don't look at seating. We don't look at anything with a number before or after the name of the institution. They earn their right. They've earned their right, and they are a good ball team. Gabe? Dennis, I'm sure it won't surprise you. Your guys are, are cracking jokes up here and, and seem pretty loose. You know, have, uh, do you have the sense that, hey, that they're in the, in the right mindset and this is, this is just another week of basketball right now? Well, this is how we've gotten to know each other and throughout our time. And sometimes when you ask, um, what, what has happened behind the scenes that allow your team, Coach Gakes, to get to where they are, I think it's, 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 it's easy to figure that out. They have fun with each other, and they ultimately have fun playing basketball with each other. They are able to get to know each other, and it's been like that since June. When you have the right guys in the locker room at the right time, it's a special place, and you get to build special memories. So this is how they've been since June, and as a head coach, I've just done my job and worked around them and made sure they're moving in a direction that I thought and is suitable for us to get to our dreams and aspirations. So they've done a tremendous job getting to know each other and, and getting to know who, who they are behind the scenes, but also allowing different moments, uh, whether it's, you know, we started the season with a great, great streak. Um, but when you look at the Kansas game, our guys were able to reflect in a positive way, no frustration, stress-free. That allows us to now respond and get right back to what we need to get to on the path we need uh, to be directed on. And the same goes for every up and down throughout a year, which every team goes through. And I'm proud that our guys are able to reflect in a manner uh, that's respectful toward each other. Over here. Dennis, after watching yesterday's game, what did you think of the way you guys played defensively? And even when they didn't get the steals, it seemed like just a lot of deflections, just really, really active on that, on that end. I thought we played in spurts. I don't think we played a great game. Again, two teams can play well and play decent. Only one team uh, get to move forward. And, you know, versus Utah State, we knew what they could do, um, but also the rhythm that they could get into. 
And we wanted to do our very best because we've seen a lot of teams throughout this season. We wanted to do our very best and execute the game plan. And I thought our guys were able to execute the game plan. But also, they were able to get through some adverse situations. And um, out of timeouts, they executed in different things. So I'm proud of them. Over here. Uh, Josh, you're with AP. Uh, so what worries you most about Princeton when, when you see them? What stands out? What worries me? Yeah. About going up well, here. Mitch is a great coach. He's going to have his guys prepared. I don't, I don't look at things as worry or not worry or anything like that. Um, both teams are going to be prepared to play. Both teams will give their very best and will do the same thing. Um, they do a great job and have done a great job. Gabe? You're talking about handling adversity, adversity kind of big picture, but how important this time of year is that within a game? I mean, for example, yesterday Kobe makes, you know, a, a pass that leads to, to the three that gives them their first lead, but it seems to immediately move on from that. It, it, is that something that evolves over time or, or that you talk to about guys within those 40 minutes? No, that's not Kobe's first turnover. <laughs> Kobe has turned the ball over before. Um, I just think that turnover specifically was led to their first three. And maybe sometimes those plays, those small minor mistakes can lead to something bigger. But Kobe Brown, that is not his first mistake. That is not going to be his last. I just want our guys to be able to get, get to the next play. And we were able to get to the next play. It, it ignited their fan base to finally see a three go in. Uh, but also one of their better players. He was a great, great player, great guard. Um, they played well, and our guys were able to play a little bit better, and we, we came out with a victory. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here, and our guys are happy to be here. You're not here by mistake. Uh, it's an invite that you receive, a bid that you receive. It's full of data, full of analytics, full of everything, and there's just not one play that can tell you that you're going to the NCAA tournament. It's not going to be one mistake to say that you're not. Uh, we just want our guys to continue to play the style of basketball and stick to our A core values and continue what we've been working on since June. Hi, Ron Krejcik from the San Francisco Chronicle. What do you remember about playing in the NCAA tournament? If I recall correctly, Cal made the second round, I think, one of your years. And was there anything different about the second game as opposed to the, the first round? Just in terms as a player? Yeah. Man, that was long ago, man. I don't remember that. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember that much, man. Um, I just thought as a uh, player, we gave our very best. And that was a time I believe we played, um, we were able to play pin. Um, and we played pin. And then the next game, we played Pittsburgh. Uh, but also we were able to play Fresno one time, I believe, in Memphis. You know, I've been part of the NIT. We were able to win an NIT national championship as a freshman. I think our coaching staff, Ben Braun, Joe Pashanak, Lou Reno, Charles Ramsey, um, John Wheeler, and Scott Beaton, uh, those guys did a great job of preparing us. And I think as we prepared, they did a great job listening. And they allowed players to have a voice, have a say. And those are the memories that you remember most. You remember your relationship with your coaches. You remember not every single game, but you do remember the situations and, and, and obviously trying to be a part of the NCAA tournament. And I, I was fortunate as a player to not only uh, be a part of the NCAA tournament, but win uh, a game in there. So. Question over here. Dennis, you, you talked uh, yesterday just about how intentional you've always been with your demeanor during games. Yeah. Did, did that evolve at Cleveland State, or was it like that from day one? Well, I'll, I'll say this. What I got better, and that's a great question, throughout my coaching time, I had to be what my bosses needed me to be as an assistant. Whether it was my idea or not, I just wanted to be the best assistant I could be for those that I worked for. Uh, whether it was a GA with Tom Crean, GA with Leonard Hamilton, I had to know my role, know my responsibility, and stay in my lane. 
Uh, once I got a full-time job, I was able to coach for the guys that coached me and work with them. So Ben Braun had responsibilities for me. I had to stay in my lane and, and execute his plan and be the best assistant. Same with Dave Carter, same with Ricardo Patton, same with Leonard Hamilton. And they gave me enough leeway to develop, to, ve to develop as a person, to develop as a coach uh, and evolve from playing. Once I became a head coach, yes, my role changed. I had to look at things a lot different than being an assistant. In fact, I called every coach and apologized to them and said, I thought I was being a great assistant, <laughs> but I was not doing what I should have done. So I appreciate you allowing me as an assistant to grow and give me the grace to get better because it's a lot of moving parts that I think I, I think is you know important for you, you and your success. So, um, Becoming a head coach is essential. You hire a great staff, and I, I believe we hired a great staff that helps me execute the plan. And that's the most important thing. And uh, we have a great institution, great leadership, Desiree Reed, Francois. Uh, we have a great president and President Moon Choi, great board of directors. We have a great sport oversight and Greg Hewlin. Uh, and it's a teamwork, and that's, that's, that's how we operate as a team. We make decisions together. Uh, I don't try to make decisions by myself. I don't care if it's about where the garbage can should be sitting or what, you know, what travel day we should leave. I try to make decisions as a partner uh, at the University of Missouri as the Witten family head men's basketball coach with my, um, you know, my oversights and those that are above me. And I make them feel a part of it. And I also make our managers, our GAs, our coaches, our players feel a part of the journey as well. And that's the one thing that stands out to me that has allowed me to continue to evolve and see things from different lenses. Ben, you're late. <laughs> Question. <laughs> as you get down, you know, to this point of the season, then you look at your team, how much of an emphasis has Des Moy Hodge, you know, are, how are his fingerprints all over this team? How much has he emphasized the way that this team plays and, and who you guys are? Well, I think from day one of putting our program uh, from my mind, my brain onto paper and then from paper onto the court, you have to have a guy like a Des Moy Hodge, but also you have to have around Des Moy Hodge, the teammates that he has that allows him to do certain things offensively and defensively and take the risks that he take. Uh, he's a, a model young man, great person, right? Unbelievable person. But he also has had coaches in his life um, that played an important part. Um, you know, Coach Parks did a, did a great job with him at his previous stop before I got him at Cleveland State. And his development during that time was very crucial um, during his junior college time. And once that took place and he got on campus at Cleveland State, uh, I was able to continue to push him in a way uh, that he needed. And sometimes you have to paint kids with different paintbrushes and you can't coach them all the same way. And he has evolved and he will continue to get better. Uh, I'm excited to see what um, this tournament has in store for him. Uh, but also, I know what he's going to continue to give uh, while he wears a Mizzou jersey. And then the next phase after that is to see what, what the world has for him as well. And you have great people, and great people usually get rewarded. Gabe. In, in an era where so much of offensive basketball is three-pointers and, and at the rim, how does Dre Golston is a, a mid-range shooter, like how unique is that? And, and how does that fit into to the bigger concept of your offense? Well, I think you have to allow all your players to be themselves. Kobe Brown is a great two-point shooter. Um, Nick Honor, Sean East with his floaters uh, and different things like that. But Dre Golston is definitely one of them as well. And you have to allow kids to be themselves. And that's what we've allowed them to do. Uh, I just ask our get kids to give their very best at all times. And whatever that very best is, uh, in their minds, I have to make sure it reflects what our planning, what our game plan, and what our execution looks like. And whether it was me interpreting that or another coach or another teammate, these guys respond and they do what we ask them to do. So I'm thankful. Tony. Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, the group that just came out to the, uh, well, they gave a shout out to you, Dr. Charles. Uh, I just wanted to know what was your uh, reasoning, your decision to uh, bring a sports psychologist in here to work with your student athletes? Well, that's a great question. I, I appreciate you asking that. At the age of 18, when I was at Cal, when I was a captain, um, I had an opportunity to meet Dr. Joe Carr. And at that point in time, I saw how impactful that was to our mental, to our emotional, to our physical development, and also to our team. Once that took place, I said to him, I think after a session, I said, Doc, when I become a head coach, and this is at 18, right? When I become a head coach, I want you to work with my team. He didn't flinch, he didn't budge, he did not mock. He nodded his head and said, okay, cool. Now, we've kept in contact during my time from graduating college all the way through my professional life. Once I got the head job at Cleveland State, I didn't tell my wife we got the job. I called Dr. Carr to see what his schedule was so that I could get him to Cleveland. And he cleared his entire schedule. Whatever was on his schedule, he cleared it because he remembered what an 18-year-old said to him back in the day, right? Those are things that stand out to me, and that's why it was important because I saw how impactful he was as a player in the locker room and, and how impactful that was when it wasn't even looked upon to have a psychologist, right? It wasn't that mental health era, that mental wellness era that we live in now. It was a time where you got a sports, you got a psychologist, what? People looked at that different, but we knew how important it was, and he, he definitely uh, helped us. And we sat, partnered, devised a plan, and he, was out, uh, he allowed uh, me to give what I was looking for, but also ways to challenge or to allow me to think differently uh, beyond the surface, above the surface, and just challenge me. He, he allows me to be a better, better coach, a better uh, partner with my team, with my uh, team, with my staff, but also with my boss, with my boss's boss, with my board, right? Those things matter with the community, uh, but also the transparency part that's, that's intact. So he's definitely been helpful. He knows what he means to me. Thank you. Uh, I think it was Noah who mentioned something about it energy generator behaviors yeah. and they mentioned dr charles and they said that dr. with a smile dr they Carr. Said, do, i'm sorry dr yeah. carter my, my, my bad uh they said that with a smile yeah. so it's when you hear things like that is it registering with your with your student athletes do they it seem like they're real receptive of it absolutely absolutely because as young people the things you you smile about the things that you think about it's like with me on the bus they'll they'll um, impersonate me to the T. That means they're listening. <laughs> That's what that means. It doesn't mean they're just mocking or they're being jokes. That means they're really listening because they have the wherewithal to now turn that into a joke and turn that into a way to deepen their uh, belief in it. And um, no different than EGBs, there's several things that we do that I can tell our guys are, are really, really focused on, but they do a great job of sharing it or pointing it out and holding each other accountable and also giving each other um, sort of like the affirmation that, okay, you're doing what we were supposed to do and you're executing a plan, whether it's between the lines or not, whether it's in the classroom or in the community or not, right? They are doing a great job of holding each other accountable and that's what you want in your program. Gabe. So who has the best Dennis Gates impression on your team and what are the chances we ever get to hear or see it? You probably have to tune into Sternberg Scoop and figure out from Ben if Trago Million or Dre Golston or Sean East has done it. I'm sure it's on film somewhere. I'm, I'm positive. <laughs> I'm positive of that, but they, they do a great job of uh, lightning, uh, not just – me, but they can impersonate probably you too. <laughs> but 
But they do a good job, man, of, of keeping it light. And um, our staff does a great job because we know how to mock those guys, too. Right corner. Um, Coach, talking to Dre in the locker room, you know, it, it sounded like you got the chance to recruit him twice, once when you were at Cleveland State and once you were here. Um, what was that pitch to him like, and, and what's it been like to get him on the team this season and coach him? Well, I think it's important to look at the history. He was at Tallahassee Community College. I knew he was a young man that could help our program, uh, but also I wanted him in that Cleveland State, um, you know, that recruiting class that had Des Moy Hodge. And they played against each other. We recruited his, high, his junior college teammate in Yael Hill, signed him. He played for us at Cleveland State. And while we competed, he saw everything come to fruition that I sat and told him could be possible. And now you have a young man that's looking from afar, and he had another opportunity to play for a coach that was right there for him, but also get to know a teammate that he could have – partnered with and that's where him and Des Moines Hodge they're the bestest of friends uh, now and I'm, I'm sure that impacts uh, Dre a little bit to say man we, we could have been teammates for three years now it's just one uh, so those guys do a, a tremendous job of getting to know each other and to have him in that process uh, the second time around uh, there's great stories to come out of a portal situation and I, I truly believe our, our team our, our culture uh, has several, uh, but also several conversations about the relationships you can also build uh, with, with your teammates. Coach, we've kind of run out of time. Perfect. Thank you for your uh, time with us. Thank you. M-I-Z.